The story of Simeon and Anna has become one of my favorites over the time of entering more deeply into the season of Advent and the current coming of the Christ child. It settles into my soul <clears throat> in a new way each time I read the words of how they encountered the child Jesus. It's a story of completion, fulfillment. There are wonderful images that one can evoke. I don't know why it went away. Um, Artists have done so over the years, and we will see a few ways that Simeon and Anna have been imagined through the eyes of others. We don't know exactly what it was like for either of them, or what their surroundings were, or what they looked like even, or how they knew that it was the real Jesus who was right there in front of them. There are parts of this narrative that we might miss if we're not paying attention. Simeon and Anna were old people, long lived for their day, when life expectancy was much shorter than the 84 years of living that we have recorded for Anna. They were both in the temple that day, Simeon guided by the spirit which rested upon him, and Anna because she made her home in the temple, which was always a curiosity to me. She was a widow for a number of years, most of her adult life. If she was the typical woman of her day, she would have been married about the age of 15. And seven years on, she was widowed, perhaps at the age of 22. And for 62 years, she made her home in the temple. Why? It could have been the only place that she had to live. There are two things noted that would be easy to miss or to take for granted if we don't pay attention to the scripture. The Holy Spirit rested upon Simeon. There was also a prophet named Anna. It was not usual for a person in that time to have the Holy Spirit rest upon them. The Holy Spirit as we know it today was not given to people in the fullness in a way that encouraged this full access. It's worth noting that when a person had the gift of the Holy Spirit, because it didn't always happen, there was also a prophet and this was also out of the ordinary. Very few prophets had been identified after the prophets we hear from in the Old Testament. Yet Anna receives this distinction. These two persons who were long lived for their time lived with an ear, a heart, an openness to the leading of the Holy Spirit. To the ways of being a voice in a time when there were limited voices. They paid attention to the voice of the Lord being revealed to them. They did not know the hour or the day when Jesus, the Messiah, would appear, yet they waited. They both lived with promise. They expected, they hoped, and they desired. As I read the scripture passage, I was drawn to the language that was active or descriptive. Rested, revealed, guided, all in reference to the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of Simeon. Dismissing, have seen, prepared, revelation. All of this spoken when the eyes of Simeon had fallen on the face of the Christ child. Amazed, Mary and Joseph, upon hearing the words of fulfillment that were spoken by Simeon over Jesus. Falling and rising, a sign that will be opposed, your soul will be pierced as well. The reality of what was to come into the life of this child and his family. Prophet, great age, widowed, who we know Anna to be, never left, worshipped, fasting in prayer, how Anna lived her life in the temple. She came, she praised, she began to tell. She began to tell all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem that this baby had come, the Messiah had been delivered to the people. These simple encounters were hardly simple. We don't know how much of his life Simeon spent anticipating the Messiah, 
We only know that he was given the promise that his eyes would fall on the face of the Savior before they were closed in death. I have often wondered if he went home that day and simply died because his life had been fulfilled. He had seen what he was waiting for. Anna spent her whole life in the temple, night and day. I would love to know where she lived, what she learned as she lived her life in the temple, what her fasting and prayer taught her all of those years, and what a myriad of experiences her eyes must have rested upon in those years of living <clears throat> within the temple walls. And I can't begin to imagine what it would be like to look into the face of the child Jesus. Most of us gathered into this place today have known about Jesus all of our lives. Most of us gathered in this place today have heard the stories of Jesus for a really long time. We have not been a part of a people who were promised a savior would come to them, one from the root of Jesse, a deliverer from the line of David, the wonderful, the counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. These were the words that rang in their ears as they heard the stories of the past, and they were waiting, they were longing. We have not been a people who were living without the coming of the promised Messiah, we have not been a people who have died waiting for this promise to be revealed. We have not been a people who didn't have the full story of God come to earth. Most of us have always known. There was a long time in history when people lived without this knowing. Anna and Simeon spent a lifetime waiting, expecting, hoping, desiring. They were fortunate enough to receive the fulfillment of their dream within the, that lifetime. But there's unlike so many others who come before and so many others of us who follow after that we may not see the fulfillment of our dreams in our lifetime. But as they saw this, this fulfillment, this coming, beholding the Christ child with their own eyes, there before them was an opening, a new way to look forward. The promise that was long offered had finally come. And it must have been a moment of confirmation for Simeon and Anna, and for Mary and Joseph as well. I'm also very curious, what does Jesus remember, if anything, of being scooped up in the arms of an old man and hearing the words being spoken over him? But there are also some hard realities in this story. Mary and Joseph, these new parents who have been asked by God to care for and nurture the Savior of the world. Like, just let that set in for a little bit. They were asked by God to care for and nurture the Savior of the world. I was thinking a lot about that as this little baby arrived in the Ray family. What if... Would you want the responsibility of parenting the child who embodied the divine along with the human? Would you want someone in your home who thought they knew absolutely everything about, well, everything? Now, really, if you have children living in your home, that's really not a stretch. And if you haven't experienced that yet, the days are coming, I assure you. And I'm not going to point over to my left because that would be inappropriate for me to call on my family, especially while he's interpreting. Sorry, Max. <laughs> but really, would you want Jesus to be a part of your family? I mean, seriously, think about that. Would you want, living, would you want Jesus living with you all the time as your brother? These words could take on some new meaning if Jesus was your brother. Just wait until I tell Dad what you have done. Now wait, do you mean Joseph or do you mean God? And how much trouble am I really in? And boy, this could get really tricky really fast. Is that what we would want in our lives? It brings a whole new level to tattling, if you think about it. Mary and Joseph were believed to be very young. They were first-time parents, 
They had to be wide-eyed about what was happening. They had an unbelievable start to their marriage. They had a child who arrived without them consummating their marriage. Oh, and toss in there that he was divine, son of God, all of that business going on. They had been sent off to Egypt for a time because there was a fear that Jesus would be killed by Herod, the whole time knowing that there were children back in their hometown in the city of David being killed killed because Jesus was born. That's a lot. That's a lot of trauma at the beginning of a life together. And they kept receiving messages, if we pay attention to the scripture, they kept receiving messages that said, Jesus might not live the life that he thought he might. But really, who of us does live the life that we thought we might live? Very few people that I know actually do. They received messages about the life of Jesus from a people who were steeped in the Holy Spirit. It'd be a little hard to not pay attention to those messages. They received words of blessing, words of fulfillment, words of praise. And people went and told their story because it was so amazing. But mixed in with those words were words about hardship, of, a, of opposition, of a soul that would be pierced for Mary also. Sorrow and joy mingled together as those who were listening to God were sharing their stories and understandings of this new child, this promised Messiah. And I think if we're honest, it's our own lives as well, that we too receive joy and sorrow mingled together as we live our lives. Simeon and Anna had received their desired wish. They beheld the Christ child with their own eyes. They were able to speak of this new reality that had just come into being in front of them. They were able to go into the future, whatever it held, and it was probably pretty short for both of them, that the future had arrived in their lifetime. So what does the story of Anna and Simeon offer us today? We don't like to compare ourselves to Jesus too much, and I get that. Yet Jesus came to the earth in full human form. We don't know when he had access to all of this divine knowledge of the worlds being formed and him being present and a part of all that unfolded. We don't know if he had to wait until later in his life for that to link up. If he had the joy of living a childhood free from the heaviness of being the creator of the world, pretty significant, I would think. I like to think that his divine superpower did not come into play until he was a little bit older. I like to think that Jesus had to learn from his mistakes, that he had to eat the food that he shouldn't have eaten and got in trouble for it, that he had to hear the word, no, you can't do that that he would have had to have learned about relationships with his siblings and his parents, just like all of us do, because it makes Jesus more real. Anna waited her whole life to lay her eyes on the Messiah, and she was not just sitting at home waiting for this. She lived in the temple with her eyes fixed upon God through fasting and prayer, and she waited a whole lifetime of waiting Was she bitter about having to wait that long? We won't ever know, because in her response to Jesus, she broke into praise and told everyone about what she had seen. Is that our response to Jesus? When we lay our eyes on the face of the Messiah, when we have been found by God, Are we ready to speak as she did and to speak words of praise? We don't have this option to pick up a child and to look into the face of the Messiah. That's not a part of our life and a part of our experience. But we do have the option to look at Jesus. We have the option to look at Jesus and to rejoice for the many, many ways that Jesus saves us each and every day, and thanks be to God that Jesus saves. We have the option to approach Jesus every day like it's the first time that we have met him. 
I wonder if Anna and Simeon relive that moment when they first saw Jesus that day until the day that they died. Was this something that they replayed? I like to think so, because I would like to imagine that this was pretty amazing. I don't know what it's like to look into the very face of God, but they had that option in front of them. I wonder if they re-engaged and reimagined that encounter with Jesus, and I wonder how it shaped their days to come. I wonder how it would shape our days to come if we revisited the times that we experienced seeing Jesus. Would it be new? Would it be fresh? Would it be alive for us? It's very unlikely that Anna and Simeon lived 30 more years to see Jesus come into his time of ministry, yet that didn't matter matter to either of them. They were simply waiting for the Messiah to come and to behold the Messiah with their own eyes. I think sometimes that we want to see what Jesus is doing way out there in the long term because we need to know how all of this is going to settle out, the world in general that sometimes we forget to look for what Jesus is doing right here, right now, in front of us, in our very presence. Anna and Simeon understood that time was not on their side. And really, time is not on any of our sides. We're getting older every day. And yet, when they received this word, this message, the presence of Christ embodied right there in front of them, they received and they praised. For that is what one does when you're looking upon the promised Messiah. May it be with us like it was for Anna and Simeon of old, so we too can say, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace, according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people. Amen.